Ahoy, everybody. Welcome to Learn With Lowell. Today, we're joined with Cy Montgomery, who is a repeat offender for the show. This is her second time being on. First time was five years ago. She, uh, for people who do not know who Cy is, she is a best-selling author, written, I think, 20 to 30 books. You're quite prolific. And if, if you haven't read one of her books, I guarantee you've seen one of her books. If When you're traveling, when you're you're in a store, like you see the soul of the octopus at the very least. Every time I go out, I, I see it. So, like, people... Um, Join me in thanking Sai for coming back on the show and being here today. Well, I'm thrilled to be back with you. Sweet. Yeah, and seriously, every time I go out to a bookstore, I, I see it. It's usually on an end cap or something. So I guarantee everyone listening, now that they see hear the name, it'll they'll start recognizing it. And you know, uh maybe we'll we'll pick up more of your books. But the today we're gonna talk about turtles, and the cool thing is we got uh, a couple animals on size end for people watching and I'll do my best to describe it for people who are just uh, listening but we got a dog in the in the in the running around for fun and she has some uh turtles which makes sense because she wrote a, a, a new book about turtles which we're going to get into but if you want to uh talk about the the the, the rare I believe that you were saying that they were in den- danger off record yes um this is would you like to meet one of my lovely little blandings they're yes. only going to be here until Monday, and then they're going to be released into the wild at the place where we've been protecting the nest site for five species of native turtles. And I got um, four uh, hatchlings last year to raise in the state Head Start program, because the idea is when they're when they're tiny little infants, they spend the winter pretty much in a state of suspended animation. They don't grow. Um, they some some species actually freeze solid. And then in the spring, after this debilitating state has gone on all winter, these brave little infants, that's when they having hatched uh, the previous the previous fall, that's when they take on the world. Mm. And everyone can eat them. Chipmunks eat them like little hamburgers. Birds eat them, fish eat them, frogs eat them. I've been releasing hatchlings in which I had the baby turtle in my hand. And as I was releasing it into the pond, a frog jumped in my hand and tried to eat it. Hmm. So for some of the endangered species, several states have begun these in these um, Head Start programs in which often schools are given these turtles to let them grow over the over the winter. And so when you release them, they're much bigger and fewer animals can eat them. And these are Blanding's turtles who are endangered. They're endangered over almost all of the United States. They're certainly endangered in New England. And because they're named Blanding's, that's the name of the species, um, mine are all named after characters in Mr. Blanding's dream house, um, which was a famous movie. Mm-hmm. This one is named Myrna Loy. Oh, it's big. Yeah, she's big now. She's fifty yeah. grams, but she was she was like five grams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was. I, I, some I go for uh, walks around this one park. And every time I'm out, there's like these little baby turtles, like the size of a like a quarter, like a really big quarter. So mm-hmm. I imagine it was like that size, and now it's like the size of your fist. Yeah, when they hatch, exactly, they're so tiny. She's a sweetheart. I don't handle them a lot because, mm-hmm. they, you know, they're meant to be wild, but they learn to recognize you very quickly. People don't realize how emotional and intelligent and athletic that turtles are. You know, we, we all love turtles. We all have turtle stories, but we don't realize some of their amazing talents and that was one reason why this spring I came out with a book illustrated by the wonderful Matt Patterson um, called The Book of Turtles, talking about all the amazing things they can do. You know, they can some can breathe through their butts, some pee out of their mouths, some can run faster than a 10 year old. Some of them climb enormous fences. Some many of them here in North America can spend the, the whole winter without taking a single breath. They remember things really well. They learn mazes, many of them faster than lab rats will learn them. Mm. And they live, some of them can live hundreds of years. And so for the fall book, the one that you've been reading in the advanced reader's edition, which I, I have the same edition you do, this isn't the final yet, but of Time and Turtles. In this book, 
This chronicles my journey learning about time with turtles as I apprenticed myself as a volunteer for over two years with a turtle rescue league and helped protect nesting areas with my friends, these blanding turtles and went to the Turtle Survival Alliance and learned how endangered they are. They're the most endangered group of animals on earth, turtles, believe mm. me. And most people don't have any idea because they see red-eared sliders or they, or they see painted turtles and piles of them sometimes just sunning themselves on rocks and logs. And we think, well, that's good. Turtles are doing well, but they're not. They're disappearing really rapidly. And 51% of the 350 plus species of turtles around the world are in danger of extinction or even already extinct in the wild and just existing in breeding assurance colonies right now. So they're really, they're really in danger. And as, as I turned 60, I'm now 65, I got really interested in the philosophical issue of time. And as you know from my other work, all of my great teachers have been animals my whole mm -hmm. life. And I thought, who better to teach me about time than this ancient species that arose with the dinosaurs? A species, um, well, there are many different species, but um, many, many of them will live for hundreds of years. They are the epitome of patience. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to go on a turtle journey. And I had no idea when I decided to do this, the pandemic was going to come. Mm -hmm. But during the pandemic, you know, what happened besides people getting sick and dying was time stopped. And while working with these turtles who know so much about time, I reconnected with a kind of time that many of us here in America in our hurried lives have forgotten. Mm -hmm. So that's what that book is about. And um, that's going to come out this fall. And you're the first person I'm talking to about it. So I'm really mm -hmm. delighted to share that with your listeners. Yeah, it's a, it's a treat to have you on. Uh, again, the for the for the turtles what was it about so when we were talking about like animals that live a long time you could have been like the blue whale like those they live for a long time i think there's some sharks that live a really long time but i wonder if the there is something just like innately peaceful about turtles i feel if like whenever i see a snapping turtle the other day i was at a park and there's a giant snapping turtle i think it was trying to lay eggs and it was just sitting right next to the road and i was like go away from the road get out of here and it just stared at me it was just happy as a log you know uh, oh, i guess a turtle in this case um but what what was about turtles themselves was there something unique about turtles as it relates to other animals that really drew you to them because there are there are other animals i feel like like a i imagine like a blue whale swimming is very peaceful and they're like they're through time as well um and at the same time you, you've swam i think with humpback whales so i think that yes. you'd be able to draw a parallel there yeah that's totally true well the thing about turtles you know the the la one one of the the books that I'm I'm known for, as you mentioned, is Soul of an Octopus, and octopuses are one of these creatures that few of us ever meet unless we're at an aquarium. But turtles, everyone knows turtles. Mm. Everyone connects with a turtle, and yet we do not know them. Um, we love them, we care about them, but most people don't fathom what their lives are like, and we don't know how to serve them either. We don't know how to help them. Many people don't realize how deadly our roads are, but those who do, I've seen so many people pull over to help a turtle. Instead of crossing the street in the direction where the turtle wants to go, they take the turtle back to where he was or where mm. she was. And most of the time, just like you pointed out, most of the time, the animal who's crossing that road is a female laden with eggs who needs to leave her wetland and go to a sandy area to lay her eggs because they don't lay their eggs in the water. They lay their eggs on land and they lay them in a sunny area so that the sun can help incubate those eggs. So when you take a turtle and cross it back to where it was coming from, it's like some poor pregnant lady was like trying to hitchhike to the hospital to have her baby. 
and you just took her back to her house. That's no good. So often people don't know. People also don't know that the right way to pick up a snapping turtle, don't pick them up by the tail. That can break their spine. People don't even realize that turtles don't come out of their shells like mm-hmm. hermit crabs do. Their shells are fused to their skeletons. But more than that, more than here's these common animals that we don't know. I was drawn to turtles because of both their patience and there's something about their gaze. There's something about their focus, the intensity of a turtle's focus. When a turtle focuses on you or on the worm it's going to eat or the place it's going to go, they put 100% of their attention there. And right now, I think in America, most people, we're looking at our phones like every 16 seconds. There's some like horrible figure that, like that. We're real twitchy in our attention. We don't know how to pay attention. No wonder we don't live in the moment. Mm-hmm. But turtles do. And turtles own time. That's what they have. And I learned this working with injured turtles at a time when our whole world seemed broken during the pandemic. Literally, we were mending shattered shells. Many people think like, oh my gosh, if the shell is cracked, the turtle's a goner. Not so. Often the turtle's shell can be smashed and the turtle will still survive. But what it needs is time. It needs to be in the the hands of a skilled rehabilitator as fast as possible and then needs time to recover. But Again, there's there's strength in that patience. There's healing in that patience. There's healing in that focus. And during the pandemic, when everybody was languishing, turtles brought me and my friends with whom I was working kind of back to life and healed us. And that's kind of the story that I tell in this, this whole narrative. There's so many great turtles that we met. Their stories are so inspiring. The turtle heroes and the the human heroes are just so exciting and quirky and fun and sweet. And the adventures that we had, oh my gosh, to do this, I got to also do sea turtle rescue on Cape Cod. I don't know Mm. if you've gotten to that chapter yet, but that's like, I think chapter 10, but um. On a December day, it was so snowy that a lot of towns in New Hampshire had just all the power was knocked out. That's when we went to rescue sea turtles off the Cape. And you would think like crazy. You don't see reptiles in a snowstorm. You don't see turtles at the beach in December. But yes, you do. And Hmm. these are some really endangered Kemp's Ridleys. They're, um, They're small sea turtles. Some sea turtles get to be. 2,000 pounds. These don't. And these are um, the ones that tend to get stuck and get washed up on the beach during storms. They tend to be adolescent turtles. They're not that big. They're maybe 10 10 pounds. Um, Although they'll get bigger. But we went on a turtle rescue in at night in a snowstorm on the Cape. I mean, that was so exciting. You'd never expect to do stuff like that. So many things I did in this book that I'd never expect to do. And I had a blast. Mm-hmm. What is it possible to take out the eggs and incubate them, or is it better to grab them as they're coming out? Um, many times, a, a female who's injured hmm. doesn't make it, but even then, at Turtle Rescue League, they can help because they can actually remove the eggs from the corpse and incubate them. And the other thing that happens is that sometimes, because turtles tend to like to to lay their eggs in sandy soil or loose soil. Someone will have just, you know, built a shed and there'll be a a pile of dirt over here. And lo and behold, here comes a turtle and lays her eggs in that pile of dirt. And the homeowner's like, ah, I've got to do my landscaping. What am I going to do? Well, if those eggs were just recently laid, you can move those eggs. Um, Mm -hmm. Turtle Rescue League actually will send it. And we did this. We went out and removed the eggs very carefully. You you can't like twist them and turn them. You have to keep them in the same position and uh, put them in an egg, egg tra- a special egg transport container and took them back to our incubators and incubated those babies and then 
let them go at the nearest wetland where they were found. So that's also really thrilling to be to be rescuing these eggs. And oh my gosh, you would just love to be there on the day that the eggs hatch because I've held turtle eggs in my hands while the babies are coming out. And each egg, each baby has a different story. Each one has a different personality. And we don't even think about this with a lot of reptiles, but they definitely have personalities. Some of the babies come out of the egg. There's just a little hole that they make with their egg tooth, this little thing on the tip of their, their beak. It's this little white dot. I'll make a little hole and you'll look at it and you'll see an eye looking out at you. Sometimes they're in a great big hurry and they just explode out of their eggs. And sometimes they just get really tired and they'll like look for a really long time. And then like one hand will come out and then the other hand will come out. Some of the eggs are real drooly with, you know, egg goo in them. Others they're dry as a bone and out comes the baby. But just out of the egg, you can tell their personalities right out of the egg. They look exactly like adult turtles, except they're this big. It's like seeing baby grandmothers and grandfathers. And I think mm. that's one reason that turtles just make us laugh with joy. They're so delightful. They're just like little dinosaurs. They arose at the time of the dinosaurs. And think of all they've survived. You know, these guys, they have survived the asteroid impact 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. They survived the ice ages. They survive multiple ice ages. The only thing they might not survive is us. And that was another reason I felt I had to write this book because their fate is in our, our hands right now. And if we save turtles, we're going to save some of the richest ecosystems in the world along with them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. The Does anyone know the logic or th the benefit of them hatching in the fall and they come out in the spring well there's a two-part question so one that seems kind of weird to me yeah. and the other thing is they emerge like the ones you were telling me about a minute ago telling us about a minute ago where they come out in december it's like they're cold-blooded animals so you think they would want to come out like when it's balmy or at least sunny out or something so yeah how do we rectify the, the that the, that weirdness with these cold-blooded animals well not all of them um hatch in that way um mm -hmm. most turtles do in fact nest in in the in the spring hmm. because they have to have the the warmth of the sun to hatch the you know to incubate the eggs so you know your incubation period is so long you you want to hatch before it freezes and get yourself in a good position some turtles will just get up and move and won't spend the entire winter just in their nest out of their eggs um, some do get up and move. And in fact, some individuals from the same nest will get up and move and others will just stay there. Again, you know, individual individual differences. But turtles can stop time, you know, because they hibernate. We call it brumation in reptiles. And one reason that they may choose to just hatch out of their, their egg but stay in the nest is there's a lot going on in the fall. Animals coming and going and everybody eats baby turtles, birds, for example, you know, and what happens in the fall, you get bird migrations and the birds are hungry. And, you know, maybe this isn't such a great time to be a baby turtle, particularly, you know, when you're just hatching out and you're hatching out, not next to your pond, but you have to walk all the way to your pond, which how do you even know where it is? You know, these little guys, they hatch with so much knowledge from their ancestors already. But I think they also, there's a learning component as they're mapping their world. So it does seem crazy. What a crappy mm -hmm. time, you know, to, to hatch in the fall just before it gets freezing cold and miserable. But I think it's because they need that warmth mm. to incubate the eggs. And interestingly, the temperature of the eggs in many species determines the sex of the turtles inside, not their genetics. So that's another problem they're facing. They're facing all the same problems that everybody is, global warming and pollution and overpopulation and highways and all this kind of stuff. But on top of that, the poor turtles have this terrible um, illegal trade, mostly in live turtles for meat 
for elixirs that don't even work in medicine and for pets. And it's wiped out like most of the turtles in Asia already. And now they're coming for our turtles here in North America. So we got to protect the turtles. Yes. The, with the climate change, does raising the temperature make them more female or male? What is the... Depends, depends on the species. But the problem yeah. is, you know, if you get all males or all females, no good. Yeah. And a few more degrees, and it's even worse. You just got boiled eggs. Hmm. Well, I was thinking that what if you, you you took like you artificially made a couple of batches female and then you, you know, put them around a nice group of uh, healthy males and then you could, you know, multiply it even faster because, I mean, you don't need that many males, honestly. You could probably like reduce. It's like I'm in general, if you were being like evil about this, but like you need more women to make babies than you need men because right. I feel this like. Is yeah. This is yeah. true. Um, and in fact, people who incubate the eggs. Um, usually are very careful to make sure that mm. the eggs are at different um, different heights or they have two different incubators set at different temperatures so you get both males and females. So um, you're you're right. I mean, we can help by making sh- you know doing what we can to get the right sex ratios out there. But another thing people don't realize is how few eggs ever hatch and of the eggs that hatch how few of those ever survive to maturity um the the national oceanic and atmospheric administration estimated between one in a thousand and one in ten thousand sea turtles manage to make it to maturity one in ten thousand that's horrible odds yeah and- almost impossible odds one in a thousand is miserable. One in ten thousand is impossible, and there's there's no reason to think that it's much better in our freshwater turtles. You know, everyone eats turtles, and with this illegal mm-hmm. trade on top of that, and with climate change on top of that, and roads on top of that, the studies I've read about the roads too are really disturbing. Some studies are just documenting that every year, 30% of your turtle population gets squashed on the road. Well, soon you're not going to have any turtles at all. Yeah. So I'm really glad that uh, some of the infrastructure projects that have been approved include animal crossings because roads are so deadly. One of the great things that happened during the pandemic for conservation was that there were fewer people on the roads. Mm -hmm. I read an an estimate um, that it saved more animals than any other conservation effort undertaken in the history of the United States. That simply having fewer people on our roads due to COVID saved more animals than anything we have ever done. Yeah, I think I was reading once that if if we didn't fish for like five years or something like that, like the world's oceans would rebound like pretty, pretty rapidly. But then you can't really get people to do that because everyone likes to eat from, you know, the ocean. Like that's one of the biggest bioavailable food sources The for for these illegal um, pet hunter, meat eater jerks from from around the world. So they're they're coming to America and they're stealing these turtles. I can't imagine a lot of people would be cool with that. How, how are we identifying them? You know, saying like, okay, this person is coming to hunt our turtles. And then what do we do to like, you know, save the turtles and stop them? Boy, it's hard. I mean, I read a paper. Um, this researcher had been following, I think it was wood turtles for, oh, 10 years and, and published a paper about this, is what I found out about wood turtles. And the next year she went back and none of the wood turtles were there anymore. A whole hmm. population had been wiped out by a poacher. So it's and it's really hard. It's not like you see this guy in the woods and you know that they're that they're a turtle poacher. Hmm. It's very, very hard. But generally they're being shipped out of the United States. And so we need to get people at the points of of exit, you know, at airports, for example. Um the illegal wildlife trade is mostly coming through our airports and we need to train people to find these things. 
that would do a lot. And the other thing that would do a lot is when we, when we find someone doing that, let's find out who their boss is and find that person and punish them. I mean, I don't want to give them 20 lashes, but I wouldn't mind putting them in jail so they can't wipe out an entire species. That would be great. Mm-hmm. And spread the word. The other thing, too, is to make people aware when they go, you know, to to a pet store, for example, don't take an endangered species home as a pet. When you go to get Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine is is mostly herbal and a lot of it really works. But there's a small percentage of traditional Chinese medicine which uses animal products. And none of these products work. So you have two horrible things going on. Animals being killed in a rhino horn, for example, being ground up and um, bear bile being being used. Um, These things do not work. The sick people that these elixirs are supposed to cure are going unhealed and animals are going extinct. So if if you go to a, a, a market in a, you know, Chinatown, for example, and and you see that there are turtles for sale there. Report that because it's illegal. Who do you? What's the agency you'd call? Oh, I w- I would call the police. I mean, call okay, the, just regular ones. Call the FBI. You know, um, call Fish and Wildlife. Mm-hmm. Call any law enforcement agency. And. Some of the turtles that at Turtle Rescue League, where, where I volunteered for a couple of years, some of the turtles that they have, one is named Sergeant Pockets, and he's named after the sergeant who got this illegal market closed down. And Sergeant Pockets, who's a red ear turtle, the darkest red ear turtle I've ever seen, he's a huge male, a huge old guy. Um, He's he's going to live there forever because he can't be released into the wild because he might have some like horrible disease because he'd been jammed in there with all these other turtles. But his name is in honor of the person that brought him into that. Thank God. But working there was a riot. It was so much fun. I wish I wish I could take you there. Um, it's this bright green building. It's an ordinary house otherwise in a suburb in in Massachusetts. And in this suburban house, these two ladies have at any one time anywhere between 250 and 1,000 turtles in the basement. And they're all turtles who've been injured or were sick or were unwanted or were confiscated. And these two ladies have just turned their lives over to, to care for these animals. And some of them, some of them will be released back into the wild, many of them, hundreds of them have been released back into the wild, healed and fine, and are laying eggs right now, thanks to them. And they've saved generations. When you save when you save one adult female turtle, you're really saving generations. And some of them are going to live at Turtle Rescue League for the rest of their lives, but they'll be cared for and they'll have good lives. Some of them are waiting for someone to adopt a treasured pet instead of buying an, an an illegal pet or going to a pet store where they're not well taken care of, you can adopt one from Turtle Rescue League or some of the other places that do the same service. But man, I had no idea that turtles had such obvious personalities. Mm. I had no clue. I had no clue that they could be so vocal. We don't even think of turtles as vocal. But there was a recent study published in Nature. They just took 50 species of turtles Every single one of them used vocal communication. Sometimes it's not at the threshold of human hearing. Sometimes when they say something, no one was listening. Hmm. But they're all, every single one of them was vocal. So, I mean, I haven't heard my little Blanding say anything yet. Maybe they wait until they're old enough to say something. But and maybe they're saying stuff to each other that they can hear that we can't. There's there's some species of turtles that communicate with each other while they're still inside their eggs. And they coordinate hatching. It's like mm. it's about time to hatch. What do you think? Well, I think it might be. I think I'm ready. What about you? Are you ready? Yeah, sure. And everyone hatches explosively at the same time and they all rush into the river. And in some cases, 
um, these giant Amazon river turtles, the mother is waiting in the river and communicates with her children to tell them, okay, come on over here. And we, this stuff is going on right under our noses and we don't even know. And I love that. I love too that just on the other side of the guardrails of a highway, there's this Edenic wilderness out there crawling with turtles and other animals. And that's something that they led me to see. And led mm-hmm. me to see so much on this journey. I, I had, you never know, you know, when you start a new book, you can't tell what's going to be revealed to you, obviously, or you wouldn't need to go on the journey, right? I really, I really trust my teachers. And um, boy, they really took me, these turtles took me for a wild ride. Is, the, is it possible for the ones that have to remain back at the, I, I keep thinking of it as a camp because it sounds so nice for the turtles, but the <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the uh, rescue center, but I just think of it like a camp, it sounds nice, but are they able to, I don't know, like have a pond there and they could like locally breed them or is the fact that they might have like a disease or something prevent them from having babies there too? Well, like, could you make, ones, could you, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, well, the ones that have, um, the ones that have been given up by other homes if they were with another turtle, they might have some weird turtle disease. Mm. So you can't let those guys go. If if they if they weren't living with other turtles, you might could let those guys go. And there is, in fact, a lovely wetland right in back of Turtle Rescue League. And they just bought a bunch of that land. So they actually own it. So mm. it's a great place to release turtles and for turtles and for turtles to breed and um, for their eggs to be safe. Because like at the place where um, I've been volunteering for a few years, where Hi, Leonard. where Myrna came from, you know what, her water's getting a little cold. Yes, her little head's going in. Um, yeah, to water. I'll put you back in the heated water. Uh, when we see um, turtles nesting, we rush out and we erect these nest protectors to keep predators from digging them mm. up. Because before they even hatch, turtles face so many dangers, all kinds of things eat turtle eggs, raccoons and skunks and dogs and, you know, ants will invade the nest and flies will lay their egg, the, their eggs inside the, the, the nest and they'll infest the, the hatchling turtles with maggots and trees will even send their roots into the eggs to steal their moisture during drought. And Hmm. they can also be drowned. You know, they can also, everything can happen to them. That's before they've even hatched yet. And when they're hatched, you know, everybody rushes to to eat them. Hmm. Every single turtle is such a miracle that it survives it all. Hi, sweetheart. I'm going to put her in her heated water just because I can see she's getting cold. And no worries. Okay, I'll be right back. There we go. There. Great. She's yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's put down to take a nap. The. <laughs> what? Uh, how big of a space? I, I always think when I hear a problem, like what could we do if you had unlimited funding? So I guess I, I'll put it to you because you you probably maybe maybe you guys have like sat down and thought, man, if we could get all these things, like what would we do? Um. If if you had unlimited funding and you have that team behind you to help you, what would be the what would be like? How many buildings would you get? You know, if you, you got the help behind to help them help you do these things as well, what would the structure look like to get the turtles to where they need to be? Uh, if somebody oh. can like, I, I, you get like full band. You can do like all the turtles in the world, or you can pick like a few to work on in particular. I don't know. Boy, well, um, at Turtle Rescue League, they have a number of projects they would really love to expand right now. Uh, They would like to move all of the box turtles, most of whom cannot be released because they were housed with other boxies and they might have a a disease. Um, They have a beautiful structure, but they can't move it in yet because they have like some things to to finish. They have to do the Mm -hmm. wire, they have to do the plumbing. They just bought all this extra land. Um, They would like to make that land more turtle hospitable 
which means certain plants should be there and other plants should not. Right now, it's just covered with poison ivy. So every time you walk out there, you come back and you're scratching everywhere. Um, Turtle Rescue League is, is just the place that I worked at, but there's similar organizations all over the United States. Some are just dedicated to sea turtles. And some, two in particular, are specifically for the most endangered turtles in the world and trying to breed assurance colonies. And they have the setup, but they need more money so that they could expand. They are um, Turtle Survival Alliance mm. in uh, North Carolina. And in the back of the book, I, I list where you can find them. And the other is the Turtle Conservancy. And they are in Ojai, California. And these are the, the two groups in America that are breeding all kinds of, of different turtles from in Ojai, they're breeding Aldabras and, um, you know, Aldabras are the big giant guys and the Galapagos, the big giant Galaps. Uh, so there's Rhodey Island snake neck turtles that they're breeding there and also at Turtle Survival Alliance. These are turtles whose necks are longer than their shells. It looks like a snake you tried to, sh to stuff into a turtle shell. They look incredibly, incredibly weird. There's also all these Southeast Asian turtles that look unlike any turtle you've ever seen. They're beautiful forest turtles. Um, there's turtles from Madagascar with gorgeous starburst patterns on, on their backs. And tens of thousands of these leave the country illegally in this hard hmm. trade um and they are being bred at both tsa and turtle conservancy specifically so that the work the the wild can be repopulated by them so happily there are a ton of places that you can you can help by supporting them but in addition to this there's stuff we can do in our own yards there's stuff we can do as we're driving down the highway you know, there's there's so that's the wonderful thing. It's a great time to be alive because there's so much we can do to help. You know, I I feel like sometimes when it seems like everything's just going to hell in a handbasket, I think I'm so glad to be alive right now because I can make my life matter and I can work on a difficult problem. And we all can. How um, for the turtles that get, I don't know, turtle napped and then sent somewhere uh, in my mind, I'm just going to hope that they're, you know, getting housed in a bed. Like someone just wants to, you know, play with them, but they, they're not eating them or <laughs> whatever, because that's mean. But uh, even that, that's not good either. But what is the value of a turtle? Like if, if I was an evil person, how much is a turtle, like an illegal turtle worth? Well, in some cases, they are essentially a part of your feng shui. Mm. So it's an ornament. It's an ornament. And a lot of times these people don't know how to take care of this turtle. And so they just die in captivity. So for the individual, a lot of times it's terrible. And, and I mean, this is one of the things we don't even think of. For every live turtle that, that ends up as someone's pet, how many turtles died because they were all stuffed in somebody's suitcase or mm. stuck in a truck? The folks who have gone at Turtle Survival Alliance, they have sent teams of people to rescue confiscated turtles. And there were turtles like stacked like cordwood with many of them with missing eyes. And, you know, they they their shells are chipped or cracked or they, they had trouble. They didn't eat anything for ages. They've got infections. Um, so for every healthy turtle that makes it out of there. You know how many died? Mm -hmm. A hundred. This was the case with with um, with the illegal trade in birds for many years. They they had figured that something like only one out of a hundred actually survived, and the rest just died in the process of getting it. Baby orangutans were once a popular pet until we realized that they'll destroy your entire house. Uh, but to get that pet, they had to kill the mother usually by cutting down the tree. And often the infant was killed when they cut down the tree and killed the mother. So what do they do? They go out and they get another one. They kill that mother. Maybe that infant survives, but maybe that infant survives with some like horrible wound or infection. 
So, so many of these animals simply die in the process of getting someone a, a pet. And if you want to have a treasured pet, the person would no more want to see the deaths of these choiceless innocents than anything. They just, they don't know. Mm. Don't know that they're being part of that whole thing. And that's the case with so many things, I think, in, in America today that, you know, we don't realize how how much how much damage that we can do how many people realized until we read it in the paper that fast fashions were you know driving underage kids to work in sweatshops in southeast asia i mean we didn't know it was like there's a shirt for seven dollars and fifty cents i'm gonna buy it so that's why I wanted to be a writer, frankly. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to put that knowledge in, in people's hands. And, and I trusted that they would care, you know, once they, once they saw. And once, once we see who turtles are, once we meet some of the heroes and heroines who are devoting their lives to saving them, you know, once we appreciate turtles' amazing abilities and unique personalities, I think we'll make it a, a point to try to protect them. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm betting my life on. Yeah. They definitely need to be protected, especially if people are doing all these things that we've been talking about thus far. The idea that someone can come to America and start depopulating our forests and whatnot that seems like something that you know everyone would get on board with stopping you know like yeah. you know, we don't like people in our backyards uh, on the best of times i feel the for how many turtles are tur- are turtles territorial and how many turtles do could fit in like an in a, like an average pond or something like how many how many turtles can fit in like an acre or something like what is the the math on this i'm just kind of curious yeah they're just starting to do the, the math mm. on that um to find that out uh, one of the things that folks are doing is affixing radio transmitters to turtle shells and finding out where do they go and what are their territories. And what we know from other animals is that the size of your territory depends on how rich that territory is, what kind of opportunities it has for finding the prey that you eat or um, or the nesting sites that you need. And because if you have a rich territory, you don't need a large territory. Uh, Siberian tigers, for example, might need a thousand square kilometers uh, in Siberia, which is not a very rich territory. Whereas, you know, in in parts of West Bengal, they have a much smaller territory because there's more prey. Um, So for turtles, they're starting to find this out right now. They're also learning to what degree personality affects what any individual turtle does. And this is something no one paid attention to 50 years ago. I mean, 50 years ago, when Jane Goodall, for example, first went into the field in Gombe to study the chimpanzees, all of her her papers were not published initially because she named her study animals and treated each one as an individual. Because what science wanted to do was number everyone because they were just one was the same as another one. You know, it didn't matter what their personalities were. Well, it totally matters what their personalities are. And right now, one of the really interesting uh, studies that Zoo New England is doing is looking at the personality of box turtles and how that affects what kind of range they have and how long they live. If you're a bold turtle, does that mean that you're so bold, some predator is going to come and eat you? Or does that mean being bold allows you to have a really good territory and keep all the other turtles out? Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure that out right now. And I think that's some of the most exciting work that's going on right now, because people for the longest time denied that reptiles had individual personalities. And the reptiles that I've gotten to know in this, in this book, um, personality plus and often not the personality you would expect one of the turtles that you've met as you started reading the book was 
fire chief. Mm -hmm. And he's a snapping turtle. People are scared to death of snapping turtles. They think snapping turtles are like eating all the baby geese. Turns out they're not the ones that eat the baby geese. They think snapping turtles will like bite you as you're swimming in the water. They never, they just don't do that. They just don't do that. Um, if you pick up a snapping turtle, it looks at you and like, here's this, you know, 120 pound monster picking them up. Well, yeah, they're going to try to get you to not pick them up. That's not because they're mean. Anyway, this guy, uh, I met fire chief in uh, 2020. In 2018, he was hit by a car. His shell was shattered. His back legs were paralyzed and his tail wouldn't move. And Turtle Rescue League came running out there. They found they found him. He, he was called Fire Chief because he lived in this heart-shaped fire pond. And the fire department had seen what happened to their turtle and he was hit by a, a truck. But these brave guys who were used to running into a burning building and saving people, they were too afraid to pick up a snapping turtle. So they call the turtle ladies from Turtle Rescue League and these two skinny ladies, one of whom is blind, by the way, go rushing out in their kayak. They find the turtle. They take Fire Chief in the kayak. They take him back. They fix up his shell. And I met him um, when uh, Matt Patterson and I, the, the artist, and I started volunteering. And the first time I saw him, I saw him murder a banana. I think Natasha might have put in the banana first. And, you know, the banana's this long. Well, she's holding the banana out here and this huge head that looked like it was the size of my thigh comes soaring like a rocket out of the water and murders that banana. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a scary thing. Oh, my gosh. But he was such a handsome guy, fire chief. And he's probably, you know, he weighs 42 pounds and he's probably my age. He's got, you know, his tail has these big dinosaurian osteoderms on it. And anyway, so as I got to know him, um, he needed some physical therapy as his, as his legs began to heal. So we would take him out of his tank and help him walk around. And you would think that this would be a great way to join the stub club and like all your fingers would be gone in like five minutes. But this guy, I somehow I just knew and, and Matt and I simultaneously knew that he understood we were helping him. And the first day we took him out of the water to walk around, we realized, you know what? We can pet his head. We can touch his hands. We can touch his tail. He's not going to bite us. He understood. And eventually, um, we even had a wheelchair for him because the turtle ladies, one of them who, who fixes appliances for a living, she's terrific at MacGyvering stuff. She made a she made a little wheelchair for him so that when he couldn't go outside and his claws would just slip on the floor, he could use his wheelchair and just use his front legs and his back legs didn't didn't have to to do anything. But um, Fire Chief is such an extraordinary turtle. And he's one of the main characters in this book. Someone who just about everyone I've ever known would have been terrified of this turtle. Some people even, we've, we've, we met a snapping turtle who, who came in with an arrow through his neck. I mean, people just vilify these animals. But Fire Chief is the gentlest, sweetest guy. I can feed him by hand a little nugget this big, and he will inhibit his bite to make sure he doesn't bite me. And this is a guy who's perfectly capable of snapping a broomstick if he wanted, but mm. he doesn't want to. He's a sweetheart. Yeah, I'm actually at that part in the book. That's uh, before before the call. That's where I got to where you're going for a walk with uh, w with him. And uh, you were mentioning that the one lady is blind and how she was still so attentive with her focus on, you know, making sure he was OK. If he's having any problems, his his legs are moving, that type of thing. It was pretty cool. Yeah, she's uh, so amazing. She, Natasha yeah. um, Nowick is 
I did not, me and, and Matt, neither one of us realized she was maligned like yeah. the first several times we met her because she's so competent and she's developed her other senses to an extraordinary degree. She's, a, she's an amazing person and um, her, her talents, she, she's particularly good at, um, at incubating uh, the, the, the eggs. She's great. She's great at that. But Alexia, her partner, has to tell her when she's handing her a great big snapping turtle, this is the front. Because <laughs> she can't tell which is the front mm-hmm. of the turtle. And when you pick up a t- uh, snapping turtle, you want to not pick them up from the front. There's actually the, uh, that section in particular, there was a, a quote that I pulled out. Because, oh, this is interesting. I want to get your thoughts on it in particular. So uh, I'll read it and then, you know, we can get, you know, like, you know, a little bit of a spoiler, I guess, but it doesn't reveal anything, I think. But all right. So you're, and actually you referenced someone who also was on the show, Liz, uh, who lived among the, the sand. But anyway, yeah, so the quote, Liz Thomas. The, yes, the, so age is not celebrated in our culture. You're, you're talking about how old uh, the turtle is. And so to give you context, and so age is not celebrated in our culture. My friend Liz, who lived among the sand Bushmen in, Namibia. Namibia. Thank you. I was getting stuck in my head. In the 1950s, reasons that in time and place where our kind need no longer fear attacks from hunting lions or tigers or pumbas, aging itself is the ultimate predator. And so you're you're making this point that you feel that in society people don't venerate age. And um, I really just wanted to like open that up a little bit because I've been doing this seri- a series on longevity and like people living longer and stuff. And uh, additionally, when I see old people, I just think, oh, great. There's someone I can learn cool stuff from, you know, I, yeah. I, I, but um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's sad that there are people that are like, oh, you know, old person, you know, let's discriminate or, or be mean to them, um, which is inappropriate, is, as inappropriate as like, you know, uh, stealing turtles from our, from our, our places go, you know, illegal hunters out there go away. But um if you if you could expand on that feeling just you know the this idea that age isn't appreciated and especially given that turtles you know, they live a long time and they're very patient and then kind of live through uh not being i think it's kind of like one of the things that i liked about them when i was reading is that it felt like whatever's going on they would live they would just like even though it doesn't make sense like i felt like they would just live through it be chill about it move on um which is a benefit of age like you like you have wisdom to know things are going to work out mm-hmm. no yeah i think you're absolutely right and um, other cultures do venerate age. Um, in the Bible, age was venerated. Um, in uh, cultures like China, age has been venerated. And typically, you know, you want someone who's lived through stuff and has experience, which is why, for example, elephants, the matriarch, is not some. 20 year old you know youngster the matriarch of your herd is an elderly but still fit female who can remember oh yeah we had a drought 30 years ago but i remember where we went now someone who's only been alive for 20 years won't remember that but someone who's been alive for 40 years 50 years will remember that And this doesn't mean that there's no room for the energy and innovation of young people at all. I mean, one hopes that one is always open to new ideas and fresh, fresh blood. But if if we ignore the elders who in Native American cultures are venerated, we ignore all that, all that wisdom. And it's to our it's to our detriment. And in our society, remember in the 60s, I never trust anybody older than 30. Um, well, you probably are a little younger than that, but in the 60s, that was kind of the saying. And and even back then, when I was young, I thought that was just garbage. Many of my, wild. I mean, many of my friends are like Liz Thomas. Liz is now 91. She's my best friend. Um, I have a number of, of friends in, in their 80s and 90s. And they're some of the smartest, kindest people that, that I know. And I mean, it, it's true that, you know, certain aspects of our physical bodies uh, start to decline. But... If you're a writer, 
if you're an artist, if you're a scientist, so many things will deepen and get honed by time. I, I'm definitely a better writer than I was in my 20s now. Mm -hmm. And my friend Matt, who just turned like 40, what was he, 42? Um, he says right away that he's so much of a better artist than he was at, at 32 and 22. So we're we're getting better. But in our society, we're always trying to hide that we're older. But I, yeah, I gray hair and stuff. I know, I know. I oh, like gray hair. I like yeah. gray hair too. Uh, I, I'm getting silver hair. And it's like it's neat. Dude, I'm getting old. Yeah, I'm getting. I'm trying to get one some eyebrow that has yeah. one gray hair in it. My mother never got gray hair, and I've inherited that from her. But I think silver hair is beautiful. I don't have it yet. God willing, I'll live long enough to get some. But I got wrinkles. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, I think even young people nowadays start have started dyeing their hair gray or silver or whatever. And I, I I know people who say, oh, I'm getting silver hair. I'm, I'm looking ugly. It's like, no, you look, you look great as you did yesterday. Like, you look, like, relax a little. But that's like, you know, they're raised into a society, you know, pushes these standards and stuff on us, which is terrible. But uh, yes, the 60s are before my time, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, born, I was born in the 90s. It's 30, it's 30 years. It's, thir it's 30 years beyond, uh, you know, uh, before me. But um, it sounds like a nice time. That's when my father was born. The... So, uh, you, you had, you know, the, the moon landing, and I think that might have been the only cool thing I can remember from the, learning about the 60s. No, you had the civil rights. That that was... Uh, that was good. I feel like I'm making a joke about the 60s now, but I'm not. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what, what you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of cool stuff happened. Do, you, um, <laughs> but I, I remember when you were, I remember how old, you know, your birthday. You don't remember the 60s. You were, you were a little kid. Uh, you were really... No, yeah. I was born in 1958. So... Yeah. You know, I don't remember 1960, yeah. but I sure remember 1964, you know, hmm. or 1965, 66, yeah. 67, 68. I remember all, I remember the Beatles. I can, you know, I know hmm. the lyrics. Um, I, I remember, you know, I was a, um, I was a military brat and my father was a general mm -hmm. and I was real little. I think I was in kindergarten, but I vividly remember the parade when he was given his stars. That's something you never forget. So I I can remember. Sir, I remember when JFK was shot. It was the day my first tooth came out. Hmm. So it was forever linked with like blood and gore in my mind. I know, isn't that crazy? But. You know, it just, it felt like, my God, the whole world was falling apart. My teeth were coming out of my head. The president got shot. Mm -hmm. To a little kid, those things are like equal. <laughs> yeah. That's traumatic. Yeah. To live through that time. We Thankfully, we haven't had anything. Well, that's not true. We've had stuff to like 9-11. But I think it's a yeah. little different. Like when the president, you're just going about your day and the president gets, you know, assassinated. Like that's a, a big, not not a hiccup, but a huge like earthquake throughout oh, no, society oh, no. and if the, um, president can get shot you know anything can happen yeah the, yeah in in the book you talked about your father and how he survived the the uh, actually i wrote it down the um the baton death march which is like wow um of all the things to survive that that's one of them because the, the japanese were not uh kind people to the people on that march and um for him to go on and then raise a daughter like you who goes on to do such amazing work i thought that was pretty cool that you would even talk about it you because know, sometimes people don't talk about it you know like there are people who go their entire lives and they realize oh their dad was a you know this person or that person they just couldn't talk about it um but there's like something sweet there that he could talk to you at least a little bit about it yeah. and you know i imagine that openness is it fuels like what you're writing today i, I don't know that's just me guessing but I really like that. I literally wrote it down. I was like, oh, mention this. I thought it was really cool. Well, um, you're, you're very intuitive and sensitive, you know. And I think you can sense that when when I'm writing about the animals who've taught me about life, I go deep into my own life, too. I use everything. Mm -hmm. My father loved turtles. He, he loved animals. And he's been gone since 1990. Um, but I carry him with me 
all the time. And I, I, I know I have his example in many ways Mm -hmm. before me. And I hope that I have some of his courage and determination knowing you have that in your, in your genes in your, in your, in your past. Um, and as an example, although he never spoke to me about this stuff, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these veterans never spoke to their family mm-hmm. about their experience, but I knew he had been through it and, and I knew how much he loved life and how that experience did not diminish him in any way. If anything, it made him even more appreciative of life and hungry for the joys of life. And that's the way I want to be in my life. And when I was taking care of a fire chief, I was taking care of an elder who'd been through a lot, who had, who had been hurt by mean people who ran him over, like my dad had. And it made me think about my dad. Mm-hmm. And it made me think of, you know, what do we have to carry forward into a cruel world to counter that cruelty? And um, I, I remembered helping my dad when he was dying of cancer and helping my, my dog Tess when she was old and failing. And that's what you, being able to say, I'll help you. Don't worry, Mm -hmm. I'll help you. Isn't this really what we want to bring into the world? Isn't this what we bring as the antidote to all that cruelty and sorrow and pain? I'll help you. We can Mm -hmm. all say that and we can all do that. And my effort to say, I'll help you, was pretty turtly for the last few years, but that counts too. It counts mm-hmm. absolutely. And it feels so good to be able to say, I'll help you and do it. And mm-hmm. we can all do it. Yeah. And uh, just uh, a minute ago, you were saying, I hope I have his strength. I-, I know many people, they try to write a book, they don't finish it because it's really hard. And then you finish the book, and you have to do all this work. You've done it. 30 times. It's one of the, like, anyone, try write a book, anyone out there, if you think it's easy. Like, I know writers, I've met writers, and I can tell you it's, like, really, really hard. And so, if you want, like, one quick example of having that strength, I think all the books that you've written, and also how, like, I don't, I think it takes a lot of courage to talk about, like, write in the way that you write. There are people who can, like, give you, like, a Wikipedia entry in terms of details, but there's, like, such a raw feeling in when I read your books. So I feel like, from what I can tell, like it's definitely there, and um, and the evidence is there in your work as well. In terms of like something, hopefully you can see, and that like like these thirty books didn't come from nowhere. Like you 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 definitely put the time and energy in to make them what they are. And it I can only imagine how hard it is. I mean, on one level, it's like it's it feels it probably feels natural in the sense that like you're writing straight from the heart. But also like you know, if the world is so cruel, like how hard is that to do? Like I think that in of itself takes a lot of courage. It's like when you, oh, it it's like, um, I think sometimes people, they, they meet people and it's like, oh, this kind person, they're like, oh, this kind of person's, you know, dumb or something I could push around or whatever, you know, it's like, how much courage does it take to be kind? You know, I think about that all the time. If you meet someone who's really kind, how much courage, like all the stuff that people have to deal with and you're having a bad day, right? How, how hard would it be to have like treat people with respect and be kind to them if you're having a bad day imagine like that person's doing that too and so i i always feel like i don't know you should be extra extra kind to people who are kind because like i think that it <laughs> is uh you know i think it's nice in general but I, I i i think that it's something to be encouraged like there's yeah. the world is better when like you're saying you, you help each other out even if it's just I don't know, like sometimes people nowadays won't even open up doors for each other it's like i don't i don't care i don't need to thank you i just do it because i think it's nice I don't anything. Have a nice day. I know. And and it feels good to us. Yeah. I, I think it, it feels good to most people. And when 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 people are cruel, I think one reason it the it cruelty 
begets cruelty is it 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 just becomes this like death spiral of of yeah. nastiness but when you have a chance to be kind it makes you feel great for the rest of the day it makes you want to continue to be kind mm-hmm. and i think most of us would so much rather do that it doesn't really cost us anything to be to be kind um i feel that way when i see a turtle crossing the street i mean I feel like oh, I have a chance to help someone. This is mm-hmm. great. This is fabulous. I'm pulling over. I'm picking that turtle up and I'm taking them where they're going. But I mm-hmm. feel the same way if I, you know, I see an elderly neighbor crossing the street. Um, I don't pick them up by the shell, but I, I will help them across the street. And one day someone's going to help me. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's taking that extra second. I'm thinking like how do anyone listening like oh I want to be more appreciative of the world around me. I think it's taking an extra se- an extra second and asking yourself like why are they doing this? So like there are times where the other day I was at Walmart and there are times where people leave their carts not in the cart place and sometimes it's like oh this is inappropriate, inappropriate. they could crash into someone else or whatever. And I see someone leaving the cart somewhere and I I take like a second like wait a minute why are they doing this? And it's it, like they have the handicap sticker and stuff, and it's like, oh, okay, they're like, it, it's probably really difficult. They're probably like a turtle that's uh, having difficulty crossing the street. And so I'll just go up and grab the car and I'm like, hey, I got you. <laughs> I got you, and I'll, I'll go put that's it away. So cool of you. And um, you know, just, I think it's, you just take an extra second, and eventually it gets easier. I think it's just like, there's like, I think there's this Native American quote or saying where it's like there's there's like two wolves and everyone there's like a wolf that's like angry wants to destroy the world there's a wolf that loves people and wants to like bring people together whatever and they're at war and then the saying goes like which one wins and uh the person telling the story and says whichever one you feed the most wins so it's like do you feed the anger which is easy to do or do you feed like the good which takes a little bit more work that's why i say like you see someone who's kind in your environment you know maybe you'd be nicer to them because they're I don't know where this idea was like, oh, a kind person, someone to push around. It's like, I don't know. Uh, there's like that saying where, you know, uh, fear, I, I, I forget how it goes, but it's basically when a, when a quiet person gets angry, be, be, be afraid. There's a, yeah. actually, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but the, my favorite, I just recently was learning about China, ancient China. And um, there's a, they had a tradition where when, in, in war, they would shave their head down to nothing, but then in peace, they would let it grow out. And so when, they wouldn't they wouldn't cut their hair at the entire time of peacetime so whenever someone got you to the point where you're going to go to war you'd shave off your you cut your hair and then you send it to that person as a warning so like the longer your hair it's like wow this person went 10 20 years with this long hair and not cutting it and i've angered this quiet kind person i'm i'm really messed up <laughs> you know i probably should do something yeah. about this it's like a warning yeah I, I like that idea this idea that's like you you angered this quiet calm turtle you know type person who's you know has you know feet of hair and no one else you know all the things in life have not affected this person but you have like that's that's a statement i i, I like that uh i don't know if it's true or not but you know, i was reading about it in ancient china they did stuff like that oh how cool what, did, yeah. what book are you reading tell me what you're reading um i don't remember what book i got that from i i'm reading right now um howard zim's uh a people's history of the united states i was reading that um I don't know where I got that. Normally, I can cite my sources. I cannot cite that source. I will look it up. And cool, I'd love to know when we're in touch yeah. afterwards. Let me know. And yeah. I've got to tell you, I'm loving your shirt. Um, my husband and I are going to NASA week after next to the Goddard Space Center. Everyone keeps telling me I should go. I've, yeah. like, I bumped into it. They're like, "Lo, you're going to go to to you know the, the center? Um, have you been there before? Is this like no, first time? I haven't. I gave a talk on Zoom to um, a gosh, there was like a thousand science communicators. And um, to thank me, they've invited me and my husband to have a behind the scenes day long VIP tour. Oh, that's awesome. Space Center, so I can't wait to go. And my husband, um, he's his name is Howard Mansfield. He has a different last name than me. He's an author. And uh, he he grew up like many of us crazy about space. You know, because we had the moon landing when we were little, and and um, it's it's his birthday next week, actually, and so it just seems like a great way to celebrate to go to NASA, to the space center. Yeah, the well, the interesting thing, if he's about your age, if you take when you were born and you subtract, like you subtract your age from it, that's how long ago Kitty Hawk was. It only took like sixty years from Kitty Hawk to landing on the moon. 
That's amazing. Yeah. It Crazy. is amazing. I and know. We have not been back. It saddens me greatly. Hopefully we'll be back with these new things that were going on with SpaceX and other things. The, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know if you have this problem, but hopefully you don't push any big red buttons while you're there. I don't, they have big red buttons, but I do feel like there's like an element of like, you have to push the big red button if you see it. So I'll understand if like something randomly gets launched while you're down there. Um, for, <laughs> for, uh, for just a, you know, rounding us back out in turtles, the there are some in in past we talk about dinosaurs. The there are some turtles that were like the size of houses, which yeah. is weird. That yeah. I think I, I think there was a hypothesis that it was the oxygen level or something that allowed animals to get so big, which is which is kind of odd considering the blue whale is like the largest organism, largest mammal or, or animal on the planet that's ever lived. That's ever lived, yeah. Yeah. So it's like at the same time we still have great thing great trying things now. But if you could if you go back in time and just see an ancient turtle that doesn't currently exist, just like go out and do its thing. Is there a turtle you'd want to see? Oh gosh, man. There's tons of turtles I would I loved I would love to see um leatherbacks and loggerheads, adult ones. They're very large animals well actually you know there's really no turtle i wouldn't love to see uh, i've seen a lot of them though because of uh going to turtle survival alliance and turtle conservancy i've seen turtles that no longer exist in the wild i've seen some of the wildest most bizarre turtles that like there's turtles who climb trees when they want to cross a stream instead of just swimming across the stream, a lot of them will climb up in a tree like a squirrel and cross over in the canopy and then come mm. back down. They're such adept climbers. Um, the Asian big-headed turtle, which is actually the name of the turtle, his head is so big he can't retract it into a shell. And mm. he has a prehensile tail like South American monkeys to help him when he climbs. So, And the Rhode Island snake-neck turtle I've, I've seen there. I have saw hatchlings of that species, tiny, darling little things, uh, just a couple of weeks ago when I was out at, at Turtle Conservancy. And there's all kinds of turtles that, um, you know, there's there's turtles with the glow-in-the-dark shells. There's turtles mm -hmm. with, like, red and black necks. There's turtles with googly eyes that can move around like a chameleon's eyes. There's, I mean, they're just such astonishing creatures and we we think we know them, but they're mm -hmm. endlessly surprising. And this is kind of like the natural world in general. You mm -hmm. know, we, we love nature. Every one of us has access to some kind of nature, even if it's the street tree outside of your window. But it's just endlessly thrilling and surprising. And each time I do a book, I get a chance to take a deep dive and... I come up a new person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your books are also inspiring. Like when I was reading the, the, the I just think of it as octopus and I can picture it. The you talk about scuba diving. I've I've wanted to scuba dive ever since. Like to to oh, learn. Wow. Yeah, it's like I don't know. I'd be cool to see an octopus. I think that'd be awesome. Because mm -hmm. uh, they're like you know. I think if I wonder what octopuses would be like if they could live as long as turtles. Oh but, my gosh. Yeah, I feel like they probably take over. But the, the, you know, yeah. I'd be fine with it. It'd be kind of nice. But um, I think about when I ask myself that question, like where would I go and what animal would I see? There, there are like places and times, not so much animals in particular that I'd want to look at. Because like the the Midwest or like America, like pre when everything thawed and like the Native Americans were coming over and stuff, if they had big turtles and and saber tooths and mammoths and all, that, it'd be it'd be really cool to see all this stuff. You know, to see like where you live. You know, ten thousand years ago, with all these big different animals, that would oh, be kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, wouldn't it be, be kind great? Of wild. Yeah. Oh, I would have loved. I would have loved that. I would have loved that. Yeah. Man, there were camels in North America. There were um, wild horses before the descendant of the Spanish horses. Um, there were giant ground sloths here. There, were all kinds of all kinds of great kinds of great critters. But the other wonderful thing is that. We haven't even cataloged all the life left mm -hmm. here on Earth. We're just starting to find out about it now. And recently, unfortunately, this was doing um, exploration for deep sea mining. Um, they, they sent a bunch of scientists down to see, you know, what critters are down there. 500 species no one even knew existed. 
down in, in the depths of the sea. But the scary part is the reason they, they were checking it out was to do deep sea mining, which mm-hmm. will, of course, disrupt the lives of all these animals that are, until now were just living their, living the dream <laughs> until we came to Laos and home. But it is such a rich planet. I love yeah. it on this planet. <laughs> yeah, people, uh, I have friends who do stuff in space, you know, going to go to Mars or moon, whatever. It's like neat, of course, but like there's so much green. Like when you were talking about the, you know, the tree outside your window, I've been living in a city. And so I didn't realize I was getting kind of ear blind to hear and just road. Like I hear like traffic right now. And so I went out to a, a, a park and it was the rustling of the leaves. Like, oh, wow, that's so wild. To, oh, to like right. to, to hear all the leaves again so anyone who's like stuck in a city or something go go find a park as far as you can where you can't hear cars driving it's it's kind of weird when you're used to just hearing cars it's it's really nice i i honestly it's i've felt sad ever coming back because i feel like i don't hear enough trees and so i've been trying to add more of it to I my schedule that you went on yeah. this ear safari you went on a yeah. safari yeah and i love that but of course you know being in in podcasting I'm, I'm sure you have very good hearing and that that was particularly pleasing to you to have this whole oral A-U-R-A-L, not O-R-A-L experience. Yeah. I bet you heard all kinds of birds and stuff too, because where there's trees, there's birds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So far. Yeah. Basically uh, every time I walk out the door, I'm starting to hear uh, birds more and more, which I think there's a, there's a joke nowadays where it's like you slowly become an ornithologist as you age. It's like, Oh, is that a bird? And then, like, I think this is a meme where it's like, oh, is that a bird? And then eventually it's like, oh, it's a horned turd wobbler. Like, everyone slowly, as the age starts liking birds, birds more and more. But you've, uh, you've, been, you've been all over the planet. Uh, is there is there a place you want to revisit or dive oh, deeper yeah. in? Oh, yeah. my God. Practically all of them. I mean, I would... Uh, I would go back to the Amazon in a New York minute. I would go back to Papua New Guinea in a New York minute. I would go back to East Africa or anywhere in Africa, pretty much that they aren't having a huge civil war and killing everybody. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to return to all of those places. The uh, New Zealand I've been to seven times and I would go back in a heartbeat. Um, but there's still places that, oh, in Mongolia, I loved going to Mongolia. Yeah, snow leopards, right? Yeah. Um, that was that was a they were all terrific. They were all terrific trips. There were some places I went that were extremely uncomfortable, though, I have to say. Mm. And um when Southeast Asia was uncomfortable. I would go back, but um I I remember in Cambodia and Laos and Thailand where I was traveling, one so hot. You would go out of your hotel and within a minute, you'd feel all your underclothes sticking to your to your skin. And two minutes later, you could hear your socks squelching in your mm. shoes because your feet <laughs> sweat. I'm not even a very sweaty person. And that was when you were staying in a hotel. If you weren't at a hotel, if you're just at some field station, leeches, more leeches than anywhere else but Queensland. I mean, huge leeches, too, dropping out of your socks and underwear. Cobras all over the place. I mean, I like cobras, but it's difficult to look at anything else when you really should be watching out for cobras. I've had cobras brush my legs many times, and they never hurt me. But, you know, you you got to constantly be watching for them. And the worst part, though, the discomfort was just part of it going to some of the markets and seeing the animals for sale there at the wet markets, like the ones Mm -hmm. that gave us COVID just breaks your heart. And then there was the unexploded ordinance, which was also a a bit of an issue. So um, I would go back to Southeast Asia, but it wouldn't be the first place I would go. You know, there's so many places I want to go though. I mean, I haven't, I haven't been to the poles, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of places I'd still love to go in South America. And golly, there's all of Europe. Um, I haven't really done much in Europe because it's not a jungle. <laughs> but there's some neat projects going on. Um, 
for example, wolves are coming back to some mm-hmm. places in Europe. They're being reintroduced. Bears, brown bears, which is what we call grizzlies. I mean, they're slightly different, but they're essentially brown bears. You know, um, they're being reintroduced in Italy. There's there's brown bears within 50 miles of Rome right now. Mm. And that's pretty that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I think I think I was reading about a bear to go to some of the forests in Poland. Hmm. Um, gosh, and there's so many great islands I'd love to go. Wouldn't you love to go to Komodo and meet a Komodo dragon? I worry about getting eating eating eaten, and I'm <laughs> glad that all the places you've been to. One of the things I always think about is how she's how she's never been eaten. But um, <laughs> since since we're we're starting to have technical troubles, and we're we're about at the end, so it's fine. Um, where when is this book coming out? What are and then uh, is there like a teaser for? You're probably not thinking your next book yet, right? Oh, my next book after that's already in publication, and the book after that's in publication. Okay. So everything's coming through the Python. Yeah this this book comes out um, September nineteenth. So that's the next one of Time and Turtles, Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell. Then in the spring, I have a book out with National Geographic books. And National Geographic has a three-part series on octopus. And they asked me to write the book that would go with the series. So that's coming out this spring. And I also have a book this spring, um, picture book for children Mm -hmm. called Brave Baby Hummingbird. And it's based on a true story about a baby hummingbird that I was able to help raise two baby hummingbirds thanks to a wonderful bird rehabilitator I worked with. And um, I've also got a book. I don't know when it's coming out about chickens and the next research I'm going to be doing, not this uh, August, but the next August, I'm going to be going to Ecuador on a scuba expedition, Mm. giant mantis. This is something that has been years in the making. It, I mean, the first trip fell through, then we had COVID, then we had COVID again. Then the wonderful photographer I work with, his mother died and we couldn't go. And then this year I've got a book tour for the turtles and we can't go. So next year, <laughs> next year, that'll be the giant mantis. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, I think you use COVID time well to, to do writing. <laughs> Uh, it's almost like Brandon Sanderson. I'm familiar with that author. He wrote like four books on, during COVID, and then he wow. did like a Kickstarter for like forty million dollars or something. Um, wow. Yeah, I think it's not the largest one. But anyway, so I'll put the those in the show notes, and then you also have a website people can check out. Uh, do, I don't think you have a newsletter. I would follow your newsletter if you had one. I know you're on Twitter. Oh, I follow you there. Well, you know what I do have is I have a news section on my website. Yes. Which has um, pictures and little, you know, reports about what I've been doing and my friends. And a map. And friends. So that that's around. And I and I do post on Facebook and I have the other social accounts, although I have to confess my wonderful assistant actually handles Instagram and Twitter because I don't really understand it. <laughs> so well, you're you're one of the few reasons that keeps me on Facebook. So there's there I have a number of people that keep trying to friending me and I keep saying no. Uh because I go on Facebook to see uh octopuses mm. and, and animals. And so it's like if you're not like Cy Montgomery <laughs> posting <laughs> something, I don't I don't care. Like I, I don't you can text me, like people can call me. I'm like, I'll see you around. It's like the only reason I go on Facebook is to see like content like yours. Oh, <laughs> so well, I highly, thank you. For, are you for, on for, Octo Nation? Have you seen all the yes, stuff? Yeah, yes. they're fabulous. Uh, they are the, the, the tattoos, the people have made octopus backpacks. It gives me the most well, there's a lot of times where I, I think, hey, I'm gonna go buy that backpack, and then I tell my wife, and then she says, No, you can't have that backpack. She's like, then I dream. <laughs> Then I can live vicariously through other people. But I, all this stuff in the show notes, I want to thank you again for coming back on the show. Uh, hopefully, the next time, it will not be five years from now. Though it would be cool Good. if it was that. 10 years total. That'd be kind of neat. But oh, that would be great. Let me know yeah. when it's on and I'll share widely because I know people love listening. <laughs>